Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Trino here. Today I'm looking at a video on a channel called The Beat with Alan Parr, Alan. in which Alan attempts to answer the question of why God created Satan in the first place, knowing full well that Satan would ultimately be responsible for messing up everything else that God ever made. So let's take a look! Recently, someone asked me this question. They said, Brother Alan, Alan, why in the world would God create Satan knowing that Satan was going to rebel against him and cause all of the problems that we have today? Yeah, that is a great question. God knows everything that will ever happen. So for every action that God takes, he can look into the future and see all the little butterfly effect consequences of that action. So naturally, he didn't think twice about creating the being who would be responsible for all of his other plans being messed up. Okay, so this is a valid question, right? I mean, if God is all knowing and he knew that Satan was gonna rebel against him and we were gonna have total and complete chaos on the earth, why in the world would God create Satan in the first place, right? Exactly. Wouldn't it have made sense for him to just create all the good angels and then just not deal with Satan at all, and then life would be a lot better? Well, right. As I have said in previous videos, usually with regards to people rather than angels, but the same thing still applies here, God is directly involved in the creation process of the angels, and he knows exactly which choices each of the angels he is making will make throughout their existence. And somehow this is still compatible with free will. Okay, sure, let's pretend that doesn't just immediately throw free will out the window. He could still just not make the angels who would freely choose to do bad things, and the good angels that he does make will still have free will. To answer that question, I want to build upon five premises, and each time I want to build on the previous one. Premise number one is that God did not create robots. Yeah, that's the free will thing. I don't really see how free will is possible if God actually is all-knowing. Like, I get it that knowing the future does not necessarily mean that you are responsible for all of the choices that go into making that future happen, but if you also want this all-knowing being to be responsible for the creation of everything, then that negates the free will thing because he knows in advance all of the downstream effects of each creation event. So how he chooses to create will change the course of events regardless of the will of those he creates. So what it comes down to is that if you want free will to actually be a thing, then you can cannot have God being both all-knowing and the creator of everything. We need to understand and accept the fact that whenever God created angels and also ultimately mankind, he created all of us with free will. But really, how is it possible to create something with free will when you know every single interaction that that thing will have in its existence, and you know exactly how the way you are creating it will affect how it handles these interactions, and you know how to create it differently to make it handle those interactions differently, any choice you make in how to create it will have downstream consequences on how it handles these interactions, and you know all of the branching trees of possibility for every single one of these creative choices, but somehow the thing that you make still has free will? He created us with the ability to choose, to choose to obey, to choose not to obey, to choose between good and evil. And he knew all of these choices in advance, and yet still chose to make beings that would make choices that would negatively affect everything else that he ever did. And if God would have controlled Satan in such a way that it was not possible for Satan to choose evil instead of good, then God would also have been removing free will, which would have been against his original intent for creation. Which then raises the question, if the existence of free will resulted in all of the evil that exists, then is free will really a good thing? Now, keep in mind that the Bible never actually says that God gave anyone free will, and in fact, depending on your translation, it even explicitly states that God created evil, so you don't need free will to explain the existence of evil. In fact, when you were going back to the Hebrew that Isaiah 45.7 was originally written in, it looks like there isn't really room for interpretation. It's evil, wickedness, mischief, misery, bad stuff. So the Bible agrees that God creates evil. The Bible also says of people who end up in hell that it would have been better for them to have never existed than to end up in hell. The Bible also says that it's just better in general to not exist than to live and witness the great evil of the world. 
And the Bible also says that more people will end up in hell than in heaven. So the Bible makes it quite clear that it is better to not exist than to exist, and that it is better to not exist than to exist and end up in hell. And it also says that more people will end up in hell than in heaven. So God knew in advance that this would be the ultimate result of everything that he did, and he did it anyway. So God gave everyone free will, knowing that Satan would end up causing the majority of the people that he would ever make to end up in hell, then proceeded to make the people that would end up in hell, then admitted in his book that it is better to never exist than to end up in hell, then told us flat out in his book that more people will end up in hell. So ultimately, it would have been better if he had just not created anyone at all. The Bible essentially says that God's plan is a bad plan, because not having created all the people would have been a better plan. Well, for the people, anyway. God could have had some reason that made the creation of everything better for himself, but he did flat out tell us in the Bible that non-existence would have been better for us. Now, with that being said, premise number two, why did God create angels in the first place? Well, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter one, verse 14, that angels were created to serve and to worship God. So God is a lazy narcissist? It says here, therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. Yeah, God is a lazy narcissist. So God is all-powerful, omnipresent, and all-knowing, which means that anything that needs doing, it literally takes him no effort just to do it himself. But then he went and made servants that could take care of things for him, things that take zero effort. And these servants also have to worship him. So not only do they do all his stuff for them, which would take him no effort, but the whole time they're doing his dirty work, they have to be constantly talking about how awesome he is. Forget Satan. Why did God need to create any of the angels? So we must understand that God's initial or original intent in creating Satan, uh, which we'll talk about in just a moment, uh, was for him to worship God and for him to serve God, just like the other angels do. So he created the ultimate evil being, knowing full well that he would turn evil, but intended for him to stay good? But then he knew that the way he was creating him was going to wind up with him being evil? This doesn't quite add up. Now, with that being said, the third premise, and I'm actually going back on something I said a moment ago, is that God did not create Satan. God actually created Lucifer. That's just semantics. It doesn't matter. God created him good, knowing full well that he would turn evil. Just because the name changed when the switch happened didn't mean that God didn't create him. Also, if we do want to play semantics and be technical with this sort of thing, the passage in Isaiah names Hillel ben Shara, which translates to shining one who makes the morning rise in the Greek text, which then turned into Lucifer in the Latin Vulgate. And also, the context of this Isaiah passage is meant to be a poetic taunt against a tyrannical ruler who is brought down by his own pride and ambition, and was explicitly about the king of Babylon. So the shining one who makes the morning rise was not Satan, it was the king of Babylon, which then turned into Lucifer over two translations. So we have to understand that uh, the word Lucifer is a positive name. It's a beautiful name. It actually describes uh, God's most beautiful created angel of all time. Ah, you have the Ezekiel passage about Lucifer up there. That one is similar to the Isaiah passage, but with a few key differences. But once again, when read in context, we find out that this is about an earthly ruler who fell from power. This time it's the king of Tyre. Your whole idea of the Satan story and his fall from grace seems to be taken more from Dante than from the Bible. As Marvin Tate, the senior professor of Old Testament interpretation at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, concluded in his 1992 paper on the subject, no passage in the Old Testament has to do directly with Satan in the sense of later literature and Christian theology. So a guy who works in the Old Testament interpretation department of a Baptist seminary whose mission statement is to be totally committed to the Bible as the word of God came to the conclusion that the character of Satan as understood by Christians does not exist in the Old Testament. And yet here you are giving us Satan's backstory that is cobbled together from unrelated verses about various rulers of earthly kingdoms as if that is supposed to explain anything about him. Like, 
Seriously, read your Bible. It says at the beginning of both the Isaiah and Ezekiel passages who those passages are about. In Isaiah, it is in the section titled Israel's Remnant Taunts Babylon, and the verse right before the poem starts is, You will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. At the beginning of the part in Ezekiel 28 that talks about Lucifer, it again makes it quite clear that it is about a human king. Hell, you don't even have to go outside the verse that you yourself had referenced on the screen. Ezekiel 28.12 starts with, Son of man, raise a lamentation upon the king of Tyre. So now we go from the question of why did God create Satan to why doesn't the Bible actually mention God's main adversary until the last 25% of the book? Can you imagine how the Harry Potter series would have played out if Voldemort was never mentioned until about a quarter of the way through the fifth book? So God didn't see fit to even mention to people that Satan exists until a hundred years before he came down to earth to defeat Satan as Jesus, and then only if you look at extra-biblical Jewish sources, because there's no mention of him in the Bible before the New Testament. And even then, it can still be argued from how the language is used that the character of Satan was still not really present, except maybe in Revelations, but was inferred in later translations. It means the son of the morning dawn. Now the word Satan and the devil and other names are names that has been assigned or attributed to Lucifer as a result of him making the decision to turn away from God. Except the term Satan is never used in the Old Testament or the Gospels as a proper noun. Now, I'm not sure about the rest of the New Testament, but even when Jesus is tempted in the desert when looking at the original Greek, there is never a proper noun used to describe the person who is doing the tempting. It is always satanas, the Greek word for adversary, which is not a proper noun by itself and is not used as such. In Matthew, he did use the word Beelzebub to describe the master of demons, but that's the closest the Gospels get to an actual Satan character. But hey, I'm not really here to argue theology. I can agree that there are the beginnings of a character that eventually morphed into what we now know as Satan today in the Gospels, but the Old Testament is completely devoid of such a character, as are any Jewish writings from before the first century BCE. And these words are more negative in nature, such as Satan means adversary, and the devil, and so on and so forth. Satan means adversary, yes. Like when the Bible refers to King David as a Satan to the Philistines. Satan was not necessarily a negative term, it was just a term used for an adversary. So the idea is this, God created Lucifer with free will. Lucifer then exercised that free will to choose evil instead of good. And at that time, his name was changed from Lucifer to Satan. Not only is this story not backed up in the Bible, but all my original points about God knowing that how he made Satan would lead to Satan becoming Satan rather than Lucifer still stand. So far, we've got God having made an angel, knowing he will become Satan eventually, and then going a few thousand years at least before telling humanity about the evil being who wants them all to burn in hell. But just because Lucifer chose evil rather than good does not mean that God was responsible for that evil any more than God is responsible for murder, right? No, absolutely not. If you want God to be all-powerful, all-knowing, and to have created everything, then God is absolutely responsible for everything that happens because he knew that his creative acts would eventually cause all those things to happen. You cannot have it both ways. The only way for God to not be directly responsible for every bad thing that has ever happened is for God to have limits on his power and or knowledge. If God creates a human being, God doesn't create a murderer, that human being makes the conscious choice to murder someone. If God creates a human being, God doesn't create thieves, he creates human beings who at some point in their life choose to steal from someone. Yeah, but God created that human being with that particular genetic code that would lead to that person's particular dispositions, which when combined with the environment that God put that human being into, would lead to that human being being a murderer or a thief. And God knew the whole time that all these factors would add up and lead to that human being a murderer or thief. Therefore, God created the murderer or thief. If I program a robot to repeatedly swing an axe around, and then I put that robot into a room full of babies, I have just made a baby killing machine and should be held responsible. But God gets a free pass because reasons? In the same way, the Bible says that everything that God created was good. It was very good. It was beautiful. So that directly contradicts the verse about God creating evil then? What about the lying spirits that he sends to people occasionally? Is a lying spirit a good thing? 
What about hell? Did God not create hell? Is hell good? See, stuff like this is why I can't pretend that the Bible is the perfect inerrant word of God. It can't even stay internally consistent. But Lucifer chose to exercise his free will in the direction of evil. Think of it this way, if you raise your children up with godly principles and one day they murder somebody or they turn away from you, is that your fault, right? Is, are you completely and totally responsible for the decisions that your children make? To a certain degree, yes. Parenting can have a drastic impact on what kind of an adult a child becomes. That being said, no parent is in 100% control of their child's temperament, genetics, and environment. God, however, was. He could have provided the best temperament and environment to Lucifer, or just chosen not to make the angel that he knew would mess everything up. If you can somehow make free will fit into a system where the guy who controls everything also knows everything and every possible alternative outcome, then surely you can take this a step further and still maintain free will when God just chooses not to make those that will freely choose evil. He's not coercing the choice in those that he does make, he's just not making those who he knows will make the evil choice. Absolutely not. Yeah, sometimes the kids are outside of my control. And sometimes, as a parent who is fallible, I do the wrong thing. But since everything is in God's control and God is perfect, he doesn't get the same escape from responsibility that I do. In the same way, God is not responsible for the decisions that we make. Yeah, but he made the decision to make us while knowing what decisions we would make, so he kind of is responsible for those decisions. There's really no way out of this without giving up one of God's omnis. God does not control the, the things that we do, because if he did, he would once again be removing free will, which is against what he uh, initially intended for his creation. How do you know that he initially intended free will for his creation anyway? And how does God decide which people to make and which not to make? He does make those decisions. There are an infinite number of potential possible people that could exist, any of which he could choose to make at any time. He chooses not to make an infinite number of people, but to limit the number. Each person that he makes, he does so while knowing all of the choices that person will make in their life. So when he makes someone, even if you can technically say he's not making their choices for them, he does know their choices, and he has chosen to make that person instead of some other potential person who would have made different choices. So God has an infinite number of options for people that he could make for every pregnancy, but he narrows it down to usually just one option. And sure, let's say that doesn't count as God making the choices for that person, but God God has now chosen which choices will be made by choosing to make the person that would make those choices. So even if free will were possible here, God is still directly responsible for all the choices ever made, because they all come back to his choice of which people to make when. Now, with people, you could make a bit of an escape hatch for this, because God has placed limits on his potential choices in the mechanisms of genetics and how sexual reproduction works, but this only pushes the problem back a step, as God is the one that set that system up, but I'll allow it. Lucifer, though, would have been a direct creation of God, not an indirect product of a sloppy reproductive mechanism. And yeah, I mean sloppy in every sense of the word. Premise number four is that evil is present so that God can demonstrate his love towards us. Okay, so I've been jumping around a bit, but let's just get back to the premise of this video. God created Lucifer with free will. Lucifer freely chose to become the evil being Satan, and then tricked Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden into eating the forbidden fruit, resulting in the fall of humanity. So God allowed the paradise that he created for humans to enjoy to be destroyed so that he could show us that he loves us? Let's not even go that broad. God allows babies to get cancer to show us that he loves us. He invented parasites that invade our bodies and cause pain, weakness, blindness, and death to show us that he loves us. Really? That's called an abusive relationship. You know, the whole I only hit you because I love you thing? Yeah, that's not a healthy relationship. So the real question that we really need to be asking here is not necessarily why did God create Satan, but why did God even create me? Why did God even create you? Good question. Assuming I don't become a Christian again before I die, he created me knowing that I would end up in hell. And it says in the Bible that it is better to never have existed than to end up in hell. So it would have been better for me to have never existed. 
So God could not have created me because he loves me, or else he would have done what was best for me and never have created me in the first place. This same thing applies to anyone that dies and goes to hell. Because uh, we are just as guilty as Satan because Satan's initial sin, Lucifer's initial sin rather, was to walk in pride. He was not content with his position in heaven and wanted something more. Oh, and there's the Isaiah passage, the one about the king of Babylon. Okay, fine. Satan walked in pride and that was his sin. Sure. Let's grant this completely unsubstantiated claim. How does that justify punishing me for the sins of Adam and Eve? Why did their actions destroy paradise for everyone? Could God not have whisked their children back to Eden when they had them and let them make their choice for themselves? Why does every human being start off with a negative tally sheet because of something they didn't even do? In the same way, I don't know about you, but there are days, there are times whenever I walk in pride. There are days whenever I walk in disobedience as well. Yeah, pretty sure that if the Bible God does exist, my YouTube channel is a big walk of disobedience for me. And I do try to avoid being prideful, but there is a healthy kind of pride. I mean, I'm proud of my kids, most days. I'm proud of my accomplishments. Give me an enema. An enema? Yes. You give them a feeling of accomplishment. But no, I don't walk around talking about how great I am. In fact, when people meet me in real life and find out I have a YouTube channel, I usually try and convince them not to watch it because I know my content is very niche and most people won't appreciate it or care about what I say. So I do have good pride sometimes, and yeah, sure, I've probably had bad pride at least on occasion, but that still doesn't answer why two people's choice to eat a fruit punishes the whole world, plants, animals, and everything. But it's only in the presence of evil where God's love can brightly shine. How does that make any sense whatsoever? I don't make my kids suffer so they can appreciate my love more when I'm nice to them. What you are describing is not a loving relationship. It is an abusive one. But the fact that we choose to disobey God every single day and yet he still continues to pursue us is a demonstration of his love. Now, take those words out of a religious context and put them in the context of any loving relationship here on earth. Now tell me if they are still loving words. My wife wouldn't obey me, but I'm still chasing her down intent on ending up with a good obedient wife so that I don't have to torture her later. The fact that I'm still chasing and pursuing her is proof that I really love her. And that type of love can only shine in the midst of darkness. My love for you can only truly shine if I make things hard for you. Dead babies? That's my love for you. Disease? Shiny, shiny love. The existence of Jurassic Park 3? Alan. That's love. Premise number five is that God is the knower of evil, but not the cause of it. Not according to the Bible. Also not according to the necessary consequence of God having all the omnis that Christians like him to have. If he knows that his action of creating a being with free will will result in evil, and he still chooses to create that being, then he has just caused all of the evil that he knew that being would cause when he created it. So sometimes people say, well, didn't God know this was going to happen? Sure, he knew it was going to happen. That doesn't mean he is the cause of it, right? How does that follow at all? If I adopt a tiger knowing full well how dangerous they are, but just let it wander around my house like a pet cat, is it my fault when that tiger inevitably injures or kills one of my family members? Yes, absolutely, because I knew the danger and chose to get the tiger anyway. It's even worse with God, because while it could be said that I knew of the potential danger to bringing a tiger into my home, God didn't know the potential evil that would happen as a result of his creation. He knew exactly what evil would happen for sure as a result of his creation. When he was creating his angels, he knew full well that Michael and Gabriel would be good protectors of his favorite tribe of people. You know, because in the Old Testament, it's made quite clear that God favors one particular tribe over everyone else on earth, like a good loving parent who has favorite children. And when he created Lucifer, he knew full well that Lucifer would end up leading a rebellion, and that would end up with the unfathomable suffering of the people that he was going to create later, and that would result in the vast majority of them burning in hell for all eternity. But then he went ahead and created Lucifer anyway. And why did he create the angels? Because he wanted servants. Not needed servants, wanted servants. Because he is all-powerful, so the most difficult task would be super easy for him, but he didn't want to have to do everything himself, even though it would be easy, so he just made others to do the jobs that are beneath him. And those others also had to tell him how amazing and great he is all the time while doing his dirty work. 
any more than if I'm looking at a building and I see a plane that's getting ready to crash into that building. I know it's going to happen. I can see it happening, but I'm not the cause of that. I'm not the person that's driving the, or flying that plane. I'm not the person that put it into the mind and into the heart of the pilot to crash that plane into that building. Eh, this analogy doesn't really hold up because if you want this to be an analogy for God, then God made the pilot knowing full well that the pilot would eventually fly the plane into the building. And you could have chosen not to build the pilot or to build him with a disposition that would lead him away from wanting to fly planes into buildings. This analogy only works if you are placing limits on God's knowledge or power. In order to take the burden of responsibility away from God, he has to either not know all the potential choices that will be made by the people that he chooses to make, or he doesn't actually have an active hand in making all the people, like the Bible says he does. In fact, these limits are actually fairly easy to justify biblically because the Bible often depicts God as a fallible being who doesn't know everything and needs reminders to, you know, not commit genocide, at least not with the same method that he already used. So, yeah, if you want God to actually not be responsible for all the evil of the world, then you have to take a more limited view of God's abilities, which is supported scripturally. So it is possible for God to know something and yet not be the cause of it. Not when he also created absolutely everything involved while fully knowing the consequences of every single one of his creative actions. Now, the better question that we really should be asking in this video is not necessarily why did God create Satan, but rather where did evil originate from in the mind and heart of Satan to begin with? Like, Good question. Because God is all-powerful, he could have made a system that allowed for free will but didn't allow for evil. In fact, such a system must exist or else there isn't free will in heaven, and everyone that uses free will as an excuse for the existence of evil also does the same thing that Alan, Alan. has done in this video and has claimed that God gave us free will because without free will, love isn't really love. So then we die and go to heaven, which is paradise with no evil. So God must then strip us of our free will in order to get us into heaven, unless it is somehow possible to have free will exist simultaneously without the presence of evil and with love being real love. In which case, God could have just saved everyone a huge headache and not sent anyone to hell if he had just made it that way in the first place. Now, in a response video where Braxton Hunter had a look at a previous video of mine dealing with a similar issue, they seem to come down on the side of free will existing in heaven, but when we get there we will just freely choose to not do evil things because we will know better by then. The example Braxton gave was of a three-year-old child eating dirt. When the three-year-old child grows up into an adult, the adult will freely choose to not eat dirt because now they know better, and us being here on Earth is the equivalent to being a three-year-old, and when we're in heaven we would be the adult who knows the consequences and will make the right choices. The thing is, though, if that is possible, then that means that it is also possible that God could have just made us with the knowledge of the consequences so that we would freely choose to make the right choice in the first place. They also say that because God is a maximally great being, then any other beings which he makes will necessarily not be maximally great because there can only be one maximally great being, which I would say that more maximally great beings are greater than one single maximally great being, so then God would necessarily make more and we would have a pantheon. But, you know, I, I don't know, I don't really study philosophy, so maybe I'm wrong there, let's just say that's not the case. Could he not make beings with maximally great goodness that are not themselves maximally great beings? You can have maximal goodness without having unlimited power, can you not? But that's off topic. I just brought that up because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't putting any arguments out there that have been soundly refuted. I don't think that this one has been. How is it possible for him to be a morally good being and then all of a sudden he turns out to be this immoral being causing so much trouble and yet the, all the other uh, angels did not? It does not matter how many angels did or did not cause trouble. It's not a problem of quantity, it's a problem of quality. God did shoddy work when he made the angels that went bad. And sadly, unfortunately for this, we really cannot give an answer to this. We have to rely on Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, which says, the Lord our God has secrets known to no one. We are not accountable for them, but we and our children are accountable forever for all that he has revealed to us so that we may obey all the terms of these instructions. To paraphrase, if it doesn't make sense, it's mysterious ways. Now stop questioning it and obey. 
So essentially, my friends, there are a lot of things that are very nebulous and confusing in terms of the origin of Satan. Whenever we read the Bible, we open it up in Genesis chapter one, verse one, there is the presence of evil that we see in uh, chapter three, but not the explanation of how it got there. Yeah. And you'd think a perfect being would be able to perfectly explain to his creation how he ended up not making a perfect creation. But here we are with him saying in Deuteronomy that some things just won't make sense to us because reasons now obey me or else. And then whenever you read some of the passages in Ezekiel chapter 28 and Isaiah chapter 14. Two of those three verses that you have on screen are explicitly about earthly rulers, and yet they have made their way into mainstream theology as being about Satan, a character that didn't exist in anything close to the version that we have today until just before Jesus' time. And the third is basically an acid trip. And actually, verse 9 of the Revelation passage is the only place in the Bible where you could possibly infer that the Serpent of Eden was actually Satan. It doesn't explicitly state it, and Jesus calls the Pharisees serpents on occasion, so it could just be that serpent was an insult. But even if I pretend that it explicitly refers to the Eden story, this means that there was something like a 700-year gap between the composition of the Eden story and the recognition that the serpent character was Satan. That's a long time for God not to come clean about who really caused the fall. You try to piece together uh, this, this uh, uh, existence, if you will, of some evil being. It just becomes very, very difficult in terms of how you interpret those passages. So there is a lot about Satan and his origin and how he came to being that the Bible is just silent on. And so it would be wrong for us to speak in areas that the Bible is silent on. And yet here we are with you attributing characteristics to Satan based on passages written about earthly rulers and speaking on Satan's origins as if these passages don't explicitly mention which kings they were being written about. But the good news for you and I is that regardless of how Satan got here, God one day is going to overcome all of the evil that we're experiencing on this earth and that Satan is going to be bound forever and ever, thrown and cast into the lake of fire. I'm sure the billions of people who end up burning in the lake of fire with Satan feel much better about it knowing that Satan will end up there too. Of course, Satan first got to roam free on Earth for thousands of years doing whatever he wanted, so he got to enjoy at least an order of magnitude more time on Earth than any of the people he's going to share hell with, but, you know, I'm sure they're happy with it. And you and I, my friend, are going to spend eternity in the new heaven and in the new Earth. Oh, not me. I'm one of those people that's destined to share the lake of fire with Satan. Yeah, I get the same punishment as the guy who's responsible for every evil thing that has ever happened. My punishment for the sum total of all the bad things I ever do earns me the same punishment as Satan, who has so much evil to his name that no matter what I do in my life, all the bad things will not even be a blip on the radar compared to Satan. This would be like giving someone who breaks the speed limit the same jail sentence as a serial killer. Except it's way more disproportionate than even that. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Ganulo, who says, LOL, he probably doesn't understand the X-Men either. Hint, it's an allegory about bigotry. This was on my Monday video, in which Dr. Jeff unironically brought up X-Men and the fact that we aren't evolving the ability to walk through walls as evidence against evolution. And he wasn't joking. I'm not even kidding here. That is one of his examples that he used. If you only watch one of my Dr. Jeff videos, that's the one to watch. But part of his video that I skipped was indeed him completely missing the point of the series. He kept talking about how Magneto wanted to exterminate all the humans because Magneto isn't just a homo sapien, he's a homo superior. And he was discussing that as if that's the necessary outcome of an evolutionary worldview, the desire for the genocide of the lesser species. And he completely ignored the fact that Magneto is the bad guy of the series. Like there's no question about that. He's the bad guy. Anyway, Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, especially Mark McManus, who are the maximally great beings who allow the flawed existence of my channel. If you'd like to be perfect by allowing imperfection to exist, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wish list, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and P.O. Box address. See you next time. <laughs>